Where are Ned Stark's bones? They were last seen being taken back up to Winterfell, but they don't seem to have arrived. And why is it important? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover Song of Ice and Fire in full, along with other great fantasy worlds like The Lord of the Rings and The Witcher. If you like the sound of that, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. Honouring the dead through funeral rites is a sacrosanct thing in Westeros, as it is in our own world. Even in the depths of war, a family's right to set someone's mortal remains to rest according to their own customs is recognised by almost everyone. How this is done does vary. Targaryens burn their dead, Tullys place the body on a boat drifting downstream and set it alight, and the Starks inter their fallen in the crypt below Winterfell, a tradition dating back millennia. Despite the variance, the principle remains the same. The highborn are returned to their family homes for their funeral. If a noble lord or lady dies far from home, you might, in normal times, expect quite a procession as their body is brought back, an honour guard of knights or vassals or family members, and some silent sisters to care for the body itself. The Silent Sisters are an order of women within the Faith of the Seven dedicated to just this, attending to the dead, particularly highborn dead. But of course, Ned Stark's death did not take place in normal times, nor was the manner of his death normal. A serving hand of the king accused of treason and then beheaded, acting as a catalyst for a continent-wide civil war. Would the convention of returning a body to its family be respected in these circumstances? Well, it probably wouldn't have been but for Tyrion. Joffrey ordered Ned's head put on a spike on the walls of the Red Keep as a warning, and there it stayed for about a month, but as soon as Tyrion arrived there, fresh with a letter from his father pronouncing him acting Hand of the King, he ordered it taken down and handed to the Silent Sisters. Then, when Rob Stark sent a letter proposing peace terms, the terms were unacceptable and everyone knew it, Tyrion took the opportunity to send Cleos Frey, the emissary and go-between, back to River Run with Ned Stark's bones. It's a fun side note here that Tyrion was only able to get away with that without Cersei objecting, because she wasn't there in the throne room that morning, because Tyrion had slipped a laxative into her wine the previous evening. She couldn't come to that meeting because, well, she was rather busy elsewhere. Tyrion really was playing a sneakily good Game of Thrones during A Clash of Kings. Anyway, the reason why Tyrion sent the Bones north was as a simple gesture of goodwill. Ned's execution had been a massive insult to the Starks, and this was a first small conciliatory step. It didn't cost him much, and he still had plenty of other bargaining chips. Sansa was still the Lannister's prisoner, and Ice, the Stark hereditary greatsword, was also still in their possession. But sending Ned's bones elevated his blanket no to all of Rob's other demands to something that perhaps, maybe one day, Day could turn into a real negotiation. And frankly, most people would accept that it was the morally right thing to do. An easy win for him, or perhaps even just an easy way to stop things getting any worse. Anyway, Sir Cleos Frey heads up to River Run, which Rob had made the base of his operations south of the Neck, along with a small retinue and some silent sisters. By the time they got there, Rob had left to fight in the Westerlands and Cat was returning from her ill-fated attempt to treat with Renly, and it's clear that the Silent Sisters and then the Tullys had treated Ned's bones with great respect despite the circumstances. This is what Cat found when she returned to Riverrun. They had laid him out on a trestle table and covered him with a banner, the white banner of House Stark with its grey direwolf sigil. I would look on him, Catelyn said. Only the bones remain, my lady. I would look on him, she repeated. One of the silent sisters turned down the banner. Bones, Catelyn thought. This is not Ned, not the man I loved, the father of my children. His hands were clasped together over his chest, skeletal fingers curled about the hilt of some longsword. They had dressed the bones in Ned's surcoat, the fine white velvet with the direwolf badge over the heart. The head had been rejoined to the body with fine silver wire. And Cat wastes no time in deciding what the next step should be. We read on. I am grateful for your service, sisters, Catelyn said, but I must lay another task upon you. Lord Eddard was a Stark, and his bones must be laid to rest beneath Winterfell. 
they will make a statue of him, a stone likeness that will sit in the dark with a direwolf at his feet and a sword across his knees. Make certain the sisters have fresh horses and aught else they need for the journey. She told Utheroid's Wayne, Hal Mollen will escort them back to Winterfell. It is his place as captain of guards. So the body is put back on a cart, still tended by the Silent Sisters, and Hal Mullen, the captain of the Winterfell Guard, commissioned to escort it north to Winterfell. Cat is right here, incidentally. Even as she spoke, the stonemasons of Winterfell were already making that statue of Ned in readiness for his bones to arrive. But the bones did not arrive. That is the last we see or hear from them. So what happened to them between River Run and Winterfell? Well, the first thing to note is that whereas Cat probably thought that the path northwards would be pretty straightforward, Rob was king of all of the lands north of them, and the Lannisters had sent the bones to her as a gesture of goodwill, so there was no reason to think that they would try to get them back, everything changed in the weeks and months that followed. The Ironborn attacked the north. Winterfell is captured and then burnt down. Moat Caelin, the castle that guards the King's Road northwards, the only overland route through the Neck to the north, is also captured by the Ironborn. Cat, who knows that route well and how long it would take Hallis and the Bones to travel northwards, wonders to herself later whether he had been able to make it through to the north in time before Moat Caelin fell. So she clearly thought it was touch and go. Maybe he had made it through or maybe he hadn't. I think we can rule out Hallis and Ned's bones being captured at Moat Caelin. We would surely have heard about that either from the Ironborn or the Boltons who captured it afterwards. So did he manage to get through on the King's Road before Moat Caelin fell? Well, again, I think we would know if he had, this time because of Barbary Dustin. Barbary Dustin is a fantastic character, and her background and motivation more than warrant a video of their own, but for the purposes of this video, the important thing is that she bears a massive grudge against Ned Stark. Years earlier, during Robert's rebellion, her husband, Lord William Dustin, went with Ned to the Tower of Joy where he died, and Ned didn't bring his bones back north, he just left them there, buried beneath a makeshift cairn. Ned also seems to have refused to say where the bones were, so Barbary Dustin couldn't even go and get them herself. And if you thought the Starks were obsessed with burying their dead, House Dustin are, if anything, even more so. Their great hall is built on top of a massive barrow in which is said to lie the remains of the first king of the first men, so Ned not bringing their lord's body back for internment was a massive deal. And now, Barbary Dustin can get her revenge, because Ned's bones have to travel through her lands in order to get to Winterfell. This is what she says to Theon while they are in the Winterfell crypts. He brought his sister's bones back north, and there she rests. But I promise you, Lord Eddard's bones will never rest beside hers. I mean to feed them to my dogs. Theon did not understand. His bones. Her lips twisted. It was an ugly smile, a smile that reminded him of Ramsay's. Catelyn Tully dispatched Lord Eddard's bones north before the Red Wedding, but your iron uncle seized Moat Caelin and closed the way. I have been watching ever since. Should those bones ever emerge from the swamps, they will get no further than Barrowton. Barbary Dustin and Theon are in the crypts because she wanted to see Ned's tomb, presumably to double-check that the bones aren't already there somehow. The frozen shut gate to the crypt and the snowdrift covering it also confirm that no one has been there for quite some time. So Ned's bones are not in the Winterfell crypt. They haven't passed overland through House Dustin's lands and don't seem to have been captured at Moat Caelin either, so where might they be? Well, we should briefly acknowledge that there is a chance that they have just been lost somewhere in the fog of war. It's a dangerous time, the Neck has its swampy dangers, and we get several reports of Silent Sisters being attacked by bandits and renegades. It's generally seen as a sign of quite how bad things have got. So could Hallis and the Silent Sisters have been attacked off-screen, as it were, with no witnesses? Perhaps his bones could even be a part of that mound of unknown bones that had grown up around the statue of Baylor in King's Landing, brought there by pious poor fellows and the like. There would certainly be some irony to Ned's bones returning to where he was beheaded, but for me it seems that too much has been made of these bones in the story for them to just disappear without explanation. 
And to understand where they might be, we should probably take a look at who Hallis Mullen is, the person commissioned to guard the Bones Passage north. Hallis Mullen is a stark loyalist, promoted to captain of the guards at Winterfell by Rob, given the honour of carrying the Stark banner as Rob's army left Winterfell, trusted to personally protect Catelyn Stark at the Battle of the Whispering Wood, and when she ventured south to parley with Renly. He threw himself in the way of danger to protect Rob at one point, and assigned extra guards to protect Bran at another, one of the most loyal of the loyal. But also, not the most gifted at lateral thinking. Cat notes how he often states the obvious, and he has to be told to escort her and Brienne out of Renly's camp after Renly's death. He hadn't realised the implications of what had happened, and still assumed that there would be a battle between the two Baratheon forces the next day. So I think we can assume that he followed orders and headed north on one of the most obvious routes, either east along the river road to the inn at the crossroads, then north up the King's Road, or north, tracking back the way Rob had originally come south, crossing the Green Fork River at the Twins. Perhaps Barbary Dustin was so sure he had got to the swamps of the Neck because she'd got word from the Freys or Boltons, who at the time were both on Team Stark, that he passed them en route. Either way, the only overland way after that was the King's Road and Moat Kalin. So this loyal but unimaginative man got close to Moat Kalin, then realised that way was impassable. Perhaps he sees the Ironborn banners flying there, or someone escaped and ran into him so he knew not to go there. What does he do? Well, he wouldn't give up or go back, because he is loyal and has been given a task to do. But he also wouldn't try anything hugely risky or unexpected, like head off road into the mountainous northern vale in search of a fishing village he could hire a boat to take to White Harbour, say. A journey west through the Twins to Seaguard to try to sail up the west coast would also surely be seen as too risky. The Ironborn were clearly on the warpath, and that was their sea. So that leaves back down south to try to find a safer port, which would mean months of extra travelling in the wrong direction, or stay there. It does rather fit our understanding of this stolid, unimaginative but loyal man that when faced with an obstacle preventing him from going where he wants to go and not wanting to turn back, he just stays where he is. Particularly when you realise that where we think he got to, the Neck, is the home to one of the other most loyal houses, and someone who will care personally about Ned Stark's remains, the Cranagmen and Howland Reed. We haven't yet met Howland Reed in A Song of Ice and Fire, but he was one of Ned Stark's closest friends and allies. They shared a tent at the tourney at Harrenhal, and Howland accompanied Ned to the Tower of Joy, being the only other person, apparently, who walked out alive from that encounter. Ned recollects that he would have died there but for Howland Reed, and Rob Stark knows how highly Ned thought of the Cranagmen. He says so, and his entire plan to retake Moat Kalin relied on their involvement. He didn't doubt them for a second, even though they'd hardly been involved at all in the war until then. Hallis Mullen was close to Rob, and will have known all this too. He will have trusted the Cranagmen too. So, for Hallis... The most obvious thing for him to do when he couldn't go north up the King's Road would be to seek the aid of Howland Reed, and Hallis was the kind of man to do the most obvious thing. Not that he probably even needed to go and find Howland, Howland probably found him. We know the Cranagmen were keeping an eye on the King's Road near Moat Kalin because they kept on firing poisoned arrows at the Ironborn, and then Theon when he approached it. As Hallis neared Moat Kalin, the Cranagerman could have just emerged from the swamp and ushered him and his precious cargo to safety. So if we are seeking an answer to where Ned's bones probably are, it's in the neck with Howland Reed. And Howland won't be the only person there. Rob sent Mage Mormont and Gelbart Glover into the neck to find Howland Reed, so there's quite the party of Stark loyalists gathering there now. It wouldn't surprise me if we learn of Moat Kalin falling once more early on in the winds of winter, this time to the Cranagman. As an aside before we conclude the video, there is one other fan theory out there we should address. The idea that Hallis Mollen has now made his way north to Winterfell, and we saw him briefly as the hooded man in a Theon chapter. If you missed this, and there's no shame if you did, it was just a very brief encounter, Theon as Reek is out in the snow at Winterfell when this happens. He came upon a man striding in the opposite direction, a hooded cloak flapping behind him. 
When they found themselves face to face, their eyes met briefly. The man put a hand on his dagger. Theon Turncloak, Theon Kinslayer. I'm not... I never... I was ironborn. False is all you were. How is it you still breathe? The gods are not done with me, Theon answered. Oddly, he was not afraid. He pulled the glove from his left hand. Lord Ramsay is not done with me. The man looked and laughed. I leave you to him, then. And that's it. Why do people think this might be Hallis? Well, this man is clearly a stark loyalist, and out of the loop about what has been going on in Winterfell and with the Boltons. He is surprised that Theon is there, and calls him Theon, not Reek. Not just Theon, but Theon Kinslayer. So someone who thought of Theon as effectively brother to Bran and Rickon. So someone who had presumably been at Winterfell while Theon was growing up. And he seems like Hallis. When he sees Theon, he states the obvious, just saying his name and Kinslayer, an echo perhaps of when Jaime was brought before Catelyn and Hallis informed her of the obvious fact that this was the Kingslayer. She could see that for herself. And the hooded man's unimaginative mind doesn't understand how Theon could have survived, like Hallis probably wouldn't have been able to. So although we don't have all that much to go on as to who this person was, it's possible. Wouldn't Theon have recognised Hallis? Perhaps, although it's noticeable that he isn't exactly in his right mind at this point, seeing ghosts from the past to everywhere he goes, and we're told right before the encounter that in the snowstorm visibility was so bad that he could barely see three feet ahead of him. That's less than a metre. Although we can't be sure, I do like the idea that this was Hallis, who is now working to restore Winterfell to the Starks. If he'd met Mage and Galbert in the neck, as we suspect, he will know that Rob legitimised Jon Snow in his will and made him his heir. They were both witnesses to Rob signing it, so there is hope. And Hallis wouldn't be able to get Ned's bones to Winterfell safely until the Boltons were kicked out of there, so perhaps he left the bones in Howland's safe hands and made his way up there to help in its liberation. Assuming that does happen, Ned's bones can then head north once more, Barbary Dustin permitting, probably arriving just in time for Winterfell and the Winterfell crypt to take up its role in the defence against the others. But that's another video altogether. If you'd like to see more videos in this series about the Great Northern Conspiracy and the Winds of Winter, please click on the link on the left of your screen now. Or to support this channel, the best way to do that is by clicking on the link to my Patreon on the right of your screen. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.